We're building uh, basically no-nonsense software for if you're building an API. Everything we do currently is we provide for free, but we do have a business model, like Ken was talking about in the morning, uh, but it's going to be additional um, tooling that we're going to be building next year. So everything that I'll be showing today is free, and you can use it online whenever you want. Um, and uh, first, I want to start off by, by talking a little bit about why we do the software that we do and, and uh, why we think it's, uh, it, it's important, why it keeps us at night and, and why we're excited about it. Um, so um, first, we already touched about it in the morning when, when I think Andre was talking about, about their uh, tools in Klarna and it picked a little bit of a flame war. But I really think I'm not going to be talking about API architecture. There's a lot of talk about API architecture, and that's what's great about REST, right? It's, it's not a specific standard, it's, it's a philosophy, and so many people interpret it differently, and there's lots of, different, you know, uh, lots of different schools on how you should build an API, which is probably good, because uh, there's lots of different customers and lots of different API uses, and so each API can be different, and that's okay. But I think uh, in addition to talking about architecture, it's also good to be talking about the tools behind it. And I think it's really you know, something that can take your API to the next level that you actually really need. And uh, most of the day, uh, most of the time, you actually build it in-house. So uh, I've seen many companies spend you know, many years building API tools, you know, whether that is you know, their API documentation, their developer portal, you know, whether that is um, you know, automated testing around your API. And that just feels like a lot of work. And, and also, it feels like something that you keep doing over and over and over. With new API, you, you, you build the same software again for a new company, for a new project. And so you know, I think that, that, that is something that we're, that we're trying to solve. We're trying to basically commoditize the API tools and infrastructure around your API, everything that's not unique to your API. And I'm going to be, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it simple. I'll, I'll tell you three problems. Three simple problems that we're trying to solve. Three stories um, of, um, of what I think is wrong with the, with the API design a lot of times. So first, uh, let's, let's focus on the, on the design itself, on the API design. So um, a model situation, you know, you, you, you're in your company and, and you need a new API. Uh, boss comes in and says, you know, we need a new API strategy, right? So what do you do? So you go into the meeting room, you invite the whole team, uh, and you brainstorm. And you sit around the whiteboard and you do a lot of, you follow the best practices um, of, of designing the API. You know, you, you perhaps download a talk by, by my mic or, you know, you, you, you look at, a, a, at all the resources out there and you try to do the best design possible. And um, then you split into teams and you go and start coding it. And again, you follow the best principles, you know, you, you do test-driven development, you write your tests first, and then you write the code, and then, and then perhaps you write a caching layer or, you know, rate limiting, and you do everything that's, that's kind of best practice for building an API. And then three months later, when the API is finished, you offer it, you know, uh, to your customers, and you probably know what happens, right? Uh, you know, a, a train wreck happens. And, and that has happened to us several times. And then you, you know, and, and the feedback on that is brutal. You know, it, either you use the wrong data structures because you didn't understand how the customer is going to use your, uh, use your API, or you got the granularity wrong and, you know, they're using your API in a way where they need, you know, 150 API calls to implement a simple use case. Or you've actually created an API about useless parts of your company and you didn't create API around the parts of your company that are, that, that are deemed interesting for developers. And, and so you can go back to the whiteboard and you think, what, what did go wrong? I mean, I, I followed all the best practices. I followed all the best principles. You know, where, where was actually the problem? And, uh, and the problem is in the title of my talk, obviously. The problem is in you building in a traditional, completely traditional, software development methodology called waterfall process, right? I mean, you design your whole product first, and then you go ahead and build the whole product. And then you throw it over the wall to your customers. And they say, well, why hasn't nobody talked to us before? And so, you know, th th this can actually be broken if you think about it a little bit. This, this is not how you have to design an API. And I think this is, this is the wrong way to design an API because it will be used by many different people in different contexts. And you need to figure out how they're going to use your API before you're actually going to build it. And so let's look at it at the whole process again. 
in a, in a little bit reimagined way and, and as well with an example from Apiary. So how can we change this process from a waterfall methodology to an agile one? So what, what is agile? You know, what, what, is, what is the thing that displaced waterfall? Well, for me, that is, among being a buzzword, obviously, uh, what, what's actually at the core of it is you know, customer interaction over a formal process. right? And so how do you get a customer involved into your API as early as possible in a meaningful way? You know, not over-designing, but in a meaningful way. So let's follow the same steps. You go to the whiteboard and you design a first iteration of your API. But then instead of you know, splitting into development teams and starting to code it, you write it down. You write it down in one of many different formats for writing down an API. Apiary has created our own format, which we call an API blueprint. Uh, mostly because we felt everything else out there was way too difficult. And I think it's actually important to have a format for describing API that is rock bottom simple. Because what you need to do is this needs to be something that you actually share with your customers. This needs to be something that you use as a platform for creativity, for collaborating, for experimenting, for iterating, for testing. And if that's way too complicated, if it looks any, anything like WSDL, which you know, WADL has just got one letter changed in there, but otherwise it's pretty much the same, um, then, then, you know, um, that, then nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to come back and start you know, telling you this is what you should do. So you actually really need to make a conscious effort to simplify things as much as possible for your end users. So that's why we built our own format. But, uh, you know, if somebody else comes, comes up with something better, we're, we're happy to use that. So you serialize your API into, you write it down. You write your ideas from the whiteboard into an API design. And then the next thing is you give out a mock server. So this is something that we do automatically. You write down the API specification. You hit the Save button. We give you a mock server. I'm not sure if it's, can you read the code? No, not really. Anybody? Hello? No? Yes? yes? OK, good. Uh, so. Um, you know, you get your own host name, you get your own complete uh, host name with, with Apiary that, that can be specific to you, and you get an API there that's static. Sure, it's not connected to your database, but it's responding exactly in the way that you've described in your API documentation. And so this is already something that you can talk about with your customers. This is something that you can take and you can give it out to your internal customers if it's an internal API, or to your early adopters that are willing to actually help you and tell you what their use cases are. And then you can, you, you can get them into this process where they're actually collaborating with you, where they're trying your API out, where they're telling you, wouldn't it be better if it actually matched this use case? And you can collaborate around it, you can experiment, you can iterate, and the iteration is rock bottom cheap because you're not changing any code. You're, you're not writing any new code. You're, you're literally just you know, iterating around the API description, around the contract. So it's, it's a couple of minutes to change the API. Um, and, and more importantly, you know, even your customer can do it. So it can, you know, if that's your style, if that's how you want to approach this, you can almost put this out to GitHub and have people you know, iterate around it, fork it, clone it, you know, change it, you know, do whatever they want with it. And that's actually a very powerful way how to get your API customers involved into that process and, 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 and collaborate with you. I know it's not for all the companies out there, but if you're able to do this, then this can be really powerful. And then when you switch to the next step and you actually get to the point where you're ready to start coding, uh, you not only have an API definition that has went through several different iterations and has got, got a lot of customer feedback enveloped into it, but you also have something that already can generate a test suite for you. So you start implementing your API and you can actually start ticking off your automated tests and, and, and you see that what you're implementing matches up with your API description. Um, so the mantra that we use around that is mock the API, then use it, and only then implement it or develop it. So don't go developing first and then use it. Um, and actually that mock and use stage is something that you can iterate around a lot of times, that you can, that you can cycle around very rapidly. So this is, um, this is one story that I wanted to tell you. The other one that I wanted to talk about is API documentation. Um, so you probably know, most of you here, and unlike most of the audience out there because you've been working with an API uh, a lot, that the documentation is the center point. I mean, documentation is basically 
the make or break thing for your API success with your customers. It is the entry point for your customers to start using your API. It is the thing that limits the adoption rate that basically is, is almost used as a marketing tool to your, to your customers uh, who are going to use your API. Uh, and some of the typical questions that you see when people looking at an API documentation is, well, okay, so here is an example of what the API looks like, but how do I actually make an HTTP call? I've never done an HTTP call before. I am a mobile developer. You know, I've never done web development. How do I do? How do I do an HTTP call? Or, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm following what's written in the documentation, but it's still not working. You know, so so what's what's going wrong? I mean, am I am I doing something wrong, or is the documentation out of date, or you know, is is it just documented wrong? Um, so we try to match that up with what I've been showing you before in the previous step. So if you exit that design stage and you've already built your API, you've also, also described it as a byproduct. And so what we can take from there is we can take that API blueprint, that description of your API, and, and we can create documentation that also includes runnable code straight in that documentation. No, notice, not an API console. I, 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 passionately talk about why I think runnable code is better than API console. Because API console is basically something that, you know, you're, you're looking at the documentation and then you click a button and it spins a wheel and then it says, yes, it responded exactly the way that was written in the documentation. And you're like, woohoo, all right. But then you switch back to your code. Then you switch back to the environment where you're going to be coding and, and you're staring at a blank screen. You're exactly where you were before. And if you are a developer that's never been using a REST API before, then that's actually a real issue. You know, if you've never been coding a mobile application that talks to a REST API, you don't know what the best practices are. Um, and, and you spend you know, the first good you know, half an hour, hour figuring out what the best practices are, or you start the wrong way, um, and then you spend a lot more time um, correcting your mistakes later. And then the second thing that I think every API documentation should have is it should be backed up by automated testing. So, you know, you've, you're doing automated testing for the rest of your code. Why not do it for your API documentation? Why not, with every single build, with every single, you know, new release, you just make sure that your API documentation is still up to date because it's actually generated out of the same source file as the automated tests. So it's backed up by automated testing. So this is what uh, API documentation looks like in, in Apiary. Um, you can see that there is a you know, request, and this is just one resource, and there's a request and response section. Um, and the request section at this point is currently switched to Ruby. So there is obviously the raw version where it's just showing what data I sent in and what, what I sent out. But then if you flip it to different languages, you just get a copy-pastable you know, three, four lines of code that are the best practice in your language of how to do an API call. You know, it's the first start. You know, it's not a full SDK, and I think that's the way it should be but we can talk about it later. But, but you know, it's, it, it is something that gets you over the first five minutes. It gets you to make that first API call. And more importantly, those code examples are actually written by our users. So they are open sourced. So they keep changing. You know, if, if the Ruby community decides that next year there is a new library for making REST API calls that's even better than the last year's one, and that's what everybody should be using from now on, then that's what you get. And I think that's exactly as it should be, because basically the best practices around how to interact with an API is almost a community-led kind of discussion around that. And the third story that I want to talk about is API support. Um, and and, and uh, you know, I've touched that on with, with several people when we were um, talking uh, uh, before the conference. And um, you know, a lot of people have that kind of experience where you where you, you were you using an API and something goes wrong, and and so you you know you, you're relegated to customer support because that's the only thing you can pretty much do, um, because you don't know why your API calls are failing, and so you call customer support and you write or you write a message to them, and they're the guys who are dealing with you know people ordering the wrong shoe size or you know the wrong color of the T-shirt or maybe you know they're not the people that are dedicated to dealing with API problems. So if you're lucky enough and you've got uh, level one support that's trained sufficiently that they just know whenever it smells like an API, I should not touch it, I should pass it on to my developers, 
then, then you know, that's, that's the better case. In the worst case scenario, you, you, you get into that loop where you're trying to go through the level one support and saying, please, can you connect me to somebody who actually understands what they're talking about? Um, by the time you get to there, by the time your, your support request gets to developers, most of the information that actually happened is already lost. You know, your, your API calls are long gone. You know, they've happened three days ago. Your logs have rotated over already. It's difficult to get them back. You know, you don't know exactly when that API call happened. And so you lose all that uh, valuable information, and then you ask the customer, can you please try to reproduce the problem? And they say, no, it's working now. And two weeks later, you know, they, they come back with the same problem. Um, and so with that ability of actually building something that is an integrated uh, documentation and mock server and, and automated test uh, test suite. Uh, we try to look at that as well and how we can how we can make that better. Um, and so each of the do each documentation that's in Apiary comes with something that that we call an API debugger. Uh, it looks like this, um, and it's embedded in each of the documentations. And your customers can use it. It's up to them. It's an opt-in. You know they can decide that if they want, they just send all their API calls through Apiary. And once they do that, we analyze the calls in real time. We display them side by side next to the documentation. And we can tell your customers, this is exactly the line where you know, you've sent the wrong data. Uh, we can go deeper, and we can, you can actually describe a schema around your data structure. So we can check. Uh, we can actually validate your API request. And we can do the same for HTTP headers as well. And so your customers can suddenly, instead of waiting for customer support and trying to get through to a real developer, they can debug themselves. 90% of the API problems because they notice that they've missed a uh, you know, required parameter here or, 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 or they've used the library that serializes cookies into HTTP headers in a slightly different way than you are expecting to. Um, these are all real case examples. And, um, and so, but if ultimately, if they don't um, debug the API problems themselves, if they don't find out you know, where the problem is, then they've already serialized all the data about how they use the API while they'll try to debug it themselves. So all they can do is they can just tick checkboxes next to a couple things, and they can say, this is my API interaction, this is where the problem occurred, and package that up as a support request and send it over. And at that moment, you already have all the information captured about where the problem was, uh, so that you can start working at reproducing it, and perhaps potentially, you know, in, 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 in some you know, utopian future, we might even try to create an automated test case out of that. So once you fix the bug, once you fix the problem, it becomes part of your test suite. It becomes part of something that you test continuously um, when you do a new API version release. So um, that's it for me. Uh, this is the last uh, slide that I have. You know, this is just how we think about what we're trying to do. Um, have a central core of you know, describing an API through building it at the start provide you with that kind of mock and rapid iteration uh, phase, and then generate automated tests and documentation out of that same core. And we think that integrating those three things together can actually be really powerful. And we're not done yet. Uh, there's very, very few things that, that we've started with, but you know, there's many things that are waiting. You know, better support for hypermedia APIs, better support for automated testing, continuous integration support, you know, deployment support. There's many, many things um, that, we can, uh, that we can look at. So uh, we've actually open sourced most of the stuff that we talk about. So I mean, feel free to uh, come and help us. The API parser, uh, API blueprint parser that, that you've seen for describing an API is open source. Several people are building test frameworks on top of that. Several other people are building generators that actually generate that API description out of their internal format with, with you know, annotations in those, inside their source code or so, on, or so on. We've also open sourced all the language examples so that if you actually create a runnable stub code out of an API documentation, then, then that's all open sourced as well. And we also open sourced a lot of our product roadmap. So if you want to look at what we're building next, or if you want to tell us that you know, this is something that you're needing sorely, then, then get in touch with us. <laughs>